excited about having Heathal on the panel. Next, we have Canadian Jessica, Jessica Scorpio, the founder of an awesome company called Get Around. And uh, for those of you who have not used Get Around, it's a way to share your existing car without creating traffic problems and sorts. So we're excited about that. Last year, we had the co-founder of Zipcar giving a keynote. So I think Jessica is Zipcar 2.0, which we're excited about. Next, we have a longtime supporter of our community, Rashmi Sinha, the co-founder of SlideShare, which we know got acquired by LinkedIn. It's becoming the India Mafia. Just wait, there's one more. I'm not done. And the last panelist we have is Monisha Perkash. Hope I said that right. Co-founder of a company called Lumo Body Tech. For people... Yeah, funded, exciting, all that fun stuff. So if you're wondering um, how to keep your back straight, you should use Lumo back, right? All right, and last but not least, my wonderful stand-in uh, moderator, Aileen Lee, who's the partner at Cowboy Ventures. Those of you who don't know, Aileen is also an icon here in Silicon Valley as a venture capitalist, and she was previously at Kleiner Perkins. So without any more time from the mic for me, I'm gonna hand it over to Aileen. But the title of this panel is about big disruptions and about disruptions that reach billions of people, where the world is going, uh, what are the important trends, and what advice do these women have to have because they are part of disrupting very large industries. So I think maybe let, let's start at this end. Talk a little bit about the inspiration that caused you to found your company. What was the big idea? What's the industry that you are starting to disrupt? And a little bit about what's been hard about it. Like what challenges have you had to overcome? So um, my company is um, Easily Do, and we're a proactive uh, productivity assistant. And yes, it's all kind of like interesting buzzwords, but the real idea is why do I have to go to 25 different apps or programs or websites to get one thing done? Simple idea, I was just telling my table on the mentoring side, why am I going, why am I being told by the bank after my account is now gone under a certain funding amount? Why? Because they want to charge you a late fee or they want to charge you a fee for the amount. They already have the information. So my data, my money, but they don't tell me the information on time. And that was the key idea we went after, which is how are we going to solve the problem of proactively giving information to people about their task, about their information, such a way that we can solve it for them before they have to go to 20 other apps to go solve it. Um, and it's a very simple idea where you pull all the different tasks from different areas, put it in one single feed, so it's proactive, it's there for you to do it, and then when you're ready to do it, you hit the do it button in the app, and it basically gets it done for you right away, right there and there, no 30 apps to go to. So that was a simple idea, we went after it. We've just launched, and we're getting some amazing feedback from our users. Can you talk a little bit more about how long it took you to get your first app out there? What, was, what did you learn from it? What was hard? And then you guys raised a Series A yes. in Q4. Was that a difficult fundraising? Did everyone get it right away? You know, it was a very difficult idea to start with. We, didn't, we weren't in Yelp or a company that actually had a solution out there in the web. So we couldn't say, hey, it's built on the web and now we're building on mobile. Um, we had to go about it in a very, um, in a very roundabout way to say, we're like a to-do list on steroids. But then we were like, okay, but we're not a to-do list. We're actually doing something much more smarter than a to-do list. And so yeah, we had to go about it and we had to create a market for it. Um, we actually even tested the market in a different country in a small beta market to fi figure out if we have the right idea, if we are functionally doing something that people need. And that was a really important step for us, which we probably wouldn't have done if we were just building, rebuilding something in a different ecosystem. Okay. We'll, we'll get back, we have some more, I have some more questions for you guys also. Jessica, why don't you go? Sure. So the idea behind Get Around is pretty simple, uh, but when we started, we 
basically got told by everyone that we were crazy and it would never work. So that's kind of the experience with most founders, I think. One sentence on get, get around. One or sure. two sentences. So, get around is a marketplace for sharing cars. Essentially, you can list your car and get paid to share it when you're not using it. Get around provides the insurance and the technology to make it simple. So, uh, basically, leveraging the 250 million cars in the U.S. that sit idle 22 hours a day. Uh, the problem we're going after is solving car overpopulation. There's a billion cars on the planet. We have too many cars. The number's only growing. And we wanted to significantly change the way people see and use cars uh, by giving them a better option to car ownership. And so with Get Around, you can find anything from a Tesla Roadster to a pickup truck, a Prius. Uh, we're in five cities now, uh, San Francisco, Austin, Portland, San Diego, and Chicago. And uh, we're going to be launching more this year. We raised a $13.9 million round last year from some incredible investors. Um, and in terms of the challenges we faced, so we came up with the idea, actually, the um, idea came to us uh, at Singularity University, which is a graduate studies program uh, in the South Bay w through NASA, Stanford, a bunch of amazing founders and um, VCs and the whole tech community. Uh, we were challenged by Larry Page to come up with an idea that could positively impact a billion people in 10 years. And so we, you know, we, we thought about lots of big ideas and we kept coming back to the transportation sector because we felt that cars and transportation really hadn't seen a lot of innovation in a really long time. And we saw a lot of key trends that we thought would bring innovation to cars, both the connected car, self-driving cars, social networks, more things, uh, making your mobility device, um, your iPhone actually your mobility device. So once we, we started, we were able to do a small pilot at Singularity, which was kind of the proof of concept, would people share their cars with strangers? In that sense, it was actually a bit of a trusted community. Uh, and so with that and some, uh, we also did some initial development of the technology there. We tested a ton of off-the-shelf hardware devices and uh, did a weekend hackathon to build up the first version of our iPhone apps, just show some um, proof of concept. Then it took us about a year and a half to actually overcome the major hurdles to launch Get Around. Uh, those are basically regulation, insurance, and technology. So on the regulation front, uh, basically the concept existed in a gray area. And in order to try and get uh, an insurance company on board with us, we chose to get some legislation passed, which would clear up how the insurance piece would work. Uh, so back in 2010, we passed a law in California since it's been passed in two other states, and it's on the docket this year in other states. Uh, with the insurance piece, we basically spent a year knocking on uh, the doors of all the major insurers. Oh, can you? All right. Oh, here you go. <laughs> I think I've been speaking to the panel this whole time. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. So <laughs> I'll fast forward through the main <laughs> concepts really quickly. So get around marketplace for sharing cars. There's 250 million cars in the U.S. that sit idle 22 hours a day. We basically thought, well, there's a lot of people who want to live car free, but the existing fleet based services can't serve that market. And so um, we, we actually faced a lot of opposition early on because everyone thought, well, car owners aren't going to share their car with strangers. And so we, we were kind of told by the smartest people in the valley, that's a cr good idea, but it's a crazy idea. It's not going to work. Uh, so we came out of Singularity University, the inaugural class, where Larry Page challenged us to come up with an idea that could positively impact a billion people in 10 years. And uh, we did an initial pilot that summer. We were testing some off-the-shelf hardware, did an iPhone hackathon, built a kind of MVP of the whole system. Uh, and through that, we basically got our first angel investor and got conviction to you know, go out there and try and found it. And there were some absolutely huge hurdles we had to overcome. We had legislative, basically regulatory hurdles, insurance, and um, also technology. So the main concept's really simple. You all have cars here. You probably, they cost you a lot of money, and uh, you could actually make anywhere from $300 to $1,200 a month sharing your car when you're not using it. So on Get Around, we have tens of thousands of members who um, are getting access to Tesla Roadsters, Fiskers, DeLoreans, really sweet cars, you name it. Um, and people are trusting us to share their car uh, and make it easy and simple. Uh, so we, we do driver screening, we provide the insurance. Uh, and we, we have hardware technology that we've developed to make it simple. So basically, uh, to sum up, uh, the main hurdles we came across were insurance, legislative, and hardware, and then we launched once You we said you spent a year and a half basically developing and iterating before you really got a product to market. Were there times when you guys said, like, 
this is just too hard? Mm -hmm. Or like, what is it that caused you to keep going? Or were there inflection points that gave you guys the courage to keep going? Yeah, so the problem we're solving is called car overpopulation. The fact that there's a billion cars on the planet and it's only growing in number. So we're very, very mission driven. And we also got super inspired by that t one billion person challenge. So I think that served us really well. Uh, we've been at it for three and a half years now. And you know, we, we hear every day that people love the service that they couldn't live without it. We're making a difference in their lives. But early on, we, we just had a lot of perseverance and almost got, uh, you know, got the motivation to prove the people wrong who said it would, wouldn't work. Awesome, okay. Rashmi, you wanna go? Sure. And you are obviously, I think you, you are the furthest along in your startup, <laughs> having had a fantastic outcome and then actually being part of LinkedIn, which has also done so fantastically since the public offering. So I'm sure you've got, and you started earlier, 2006? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so talk a little bit about the story about how you got started People think you were crazy, that people would want to sl share slides? Yes, absolutely. People definitely thought we were crazy to think that people would share presentations. And uh, I remember people telling us, you know, presentations are for private sharing. Nobody is going to put them on the web. Uh, people email them to each other because it's only for private sharing. But we really had this vision of this be there being this public space where people would share and would learn from each other. And it would be a way to share visual knowledge. And you know, when we started off, uh, immediately, I mean, I remember uh, the, the, so we, we thought of the idea in April 2006. And we started iterating on, on the, we didn't know the word MVP, but that's pretty much what we were doing. And we launched in uh, October. And we launched with a simple, somebody knew somebody at TechCrunch, and Michael Arrington wrote a story. And uh, immediately, people just started uploading uh, PowerPoints to SlideShare. Just it was immediate, uh, right then moment. And all sorts of things, from you know academic uh, presentations to business presentations to even sermons. I didn't know that there were PowerPoint sermons before that. Just all sorts of content started getting uploaded in the first day. So we clearly hit upon a need. And in the beginning, people would upload uh, just to put it back on their own blog. And it was, so we, we created a utility. People found it useful. They said, okay, I'm just going to take it back to my own blog. But sooner they, soon they started discovering that they were getting a lot more views on SlideShare than they were getting on their own blog. So uh, about a year into it, it kind of switched where people now uploaded to be on SlideShare, not to just take it back to their own, own blog. That became a secondary motivation. Um, so that was really the launch story, and you know, I think a lot of different people thought we were crazy, including investors, that this is never going to work. You know, this doesn't make any sense. And even uh, we got traction pretty early on. So I remember even going, you know, talking to people when we had three to four million users, and even then they were like, "This will not grow. You know, this cannot grow." So now, you know, we have, uh, in just terms of the site, we have up to. 60, 65 million, if we count the embed traffic, that's you know, a much bigger number. And uh, you know, so it's been fun proving people wrong. And so never let somebody telling you you are crazy get you down. You know, that probably means you're on the right path. And you're, you're seeing something that they can't see yet. That's really what's happening. Awesome, that's awesome. Okay, and then we, can you show us the Lumos? Are you wearing it? Okay. <laughs> If you give us a little little bit of an overview on Lumos and then talk about, you also raised the Series A in December. That's right. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so our first product is Lumobac. It's a posture sensor. It's very thin, flexible, and comfortable, worn around your lower back. And how it works is when you slouch, it vibrates to remind you to straighten up. <laughs> Uh, I, told, I told her my mom would buy five of those. <laughs> my mom would make everyone in our family wear those. Um, and posture, you know, why is posture important? For a number of reasons. It's scientifically correlated with back pain. It, back pain's a $50 billion problem. It's the second most common reason why people go to the doctor. Uh, it's outnumbered only by the common cold. And posture is also related to core strength and to general health and wellness. Um, but the hard part about posture is remembering, um, and th that's what it does. It also connects wirelessly to an app on your smartphone, and there's this cute little avatar that emulates your movement. So not only whether you're slouching or straight, but also whether you're sitting, standing, walking, running, laying down, what side you're laying down on, we can get insights into all of those kinds of 
behaviors. And how the idea came um, was my co-founders and I were actually going through a search process looking at multiple ideas in health, energy, education, because uh, those were our respective passions and, and backgrounds. And we didn't have to look too far. Um, my co-founder, the engineer on our team, um, he's been suffering from back pain for more than 10 years, has tried everything, and he started taking these posture classes, and it was life-changing for him. And that's when the little light bulb went on for us where we said, wow, maybe the search is over. It's right here. You know, can we use wearable sensors that give you the same kind of feedback and guidance that a posture class might and give you a deepened awareness about your body so that you can self-correct, develop good muscle memory over time, and develop better posture? You know, hardware is traditionally very difficult like yes. Silicon Valley has kind of had an allergy to hardware. So was it hard to raise money for this for your company? Initially, it really was. A lot of investors are scared by the working capital requirements of a hardware company. But at the end of the day, this is not a hardware company. The real value of what we're doing is in the data and in the insights and the actionable feedback, actionable feedback that the user gets from using the sensor. Um, and so, you know, that's really where our core IP is. And for the really progressive investors that saw that, um, it wasn't as scary for them. And so we eventually were able to, uh, we just closed our round of 5 million Series A right before the holidays. Congratulations. Thank you. But, but your money came initially from where? Well, so uh, a few places. So we did an initial seed round that included angels and seed investors. But in the interim, we also did a Kickstarter campaign because we also wanted to just prove to ourselves, is there a market here? And so we wanted to get that market validation. Uh, we ran a campaign with the goal of getting $100,000 worth of pre-orders uh, within one month time. And we were able to double that goal. Um, and so that was exciting to us that there are actually people out there who are willing to spend money on a product that doesn't even exist yet um, and that we, are, we truly are addressing a real pain point. That's awesome. Okay, so quickly, I think we're running out of time. I'd love to hear now, knowing what you know now, what do you wish you had known? So specific to yeah, the opportunity that we're... Just in general, like wish I had known or I wish I had done something differently. Um, so for me, it, it's kind of off topic of what we just talked about, but I shared this uh, earlier with Aileen is, uh, you know, there's always been this concept of work-life balance, which I just think is a myth, um, especially if you're an entrepreneur. And for me, the, the enlightenment that I've get, gotten for myself recently is it's more about work-life convergence. Um, especially for me, I have two little kids, you know, I'm a really passionate mom, um, but I'm also a very passionate entrepreneur. And there's this notion that I need to keep those things separate is just doesn't make sense to me. And so for me, at every opportunity that I have, I introduce my kids into my work. You know, I bring them to parties. I, we recently moved offices. They help to build the furniture. And then I also work at home a lot, right? And they see me working. And so I think for me, the ability to try to have it all, it's more embracing work-life work convergence. And I wish I had known that before because in the past, I really tried to keep things separate and you know, felt like I never did either thing well. So before I talk about uh, what my realizations would be, I, I agree with that one so deeply. Uh, I think that's a really great point. You know, um, I had twins last year in the beginning of the year, wow. and I had never imagined that in the same year I would have twins and get acquired. <laughs> so you know, I have three yeah. months twins at home. <laughs> And, and, you know, it's all worked out. It's been great, you know, like uh, I was dealing with the due diligence with having one of them, you know, around me. So it's, 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 it's great. It's perfectly fine. It works. If it works for you, you'll make it work and you don't need to be afraid of it. Um, so I think uh, going back to the original question in terms of uh, what I wish I had known, I wish I had realized that every entrepreneur ha has a lot of the same fears. I think entrepreneurship is a very lonely thing. And often when you're, you've just founded a company and you know people think you have a crazy idea, this will never work, it's kind of scary. It's, uh, you have moments of lack of confidence and I wish I knew that this is not unusual, this happens. Just kind of, I kind of just like went through it and did it anyway, but I wish I had that realization, which I think at that point we were too busy to even be hanging around other entrepreneurs and I wish we'd probably spent more time hanging around other entrepreneurs and realizing that on an explicit level. So all of you who are trying to found companies and are working through the different stages, you're not alone. Turn to each other and talk to each other and be inspired by each other.
So I also got twins last year. <laughs> Twin dogs. <laughs> So my uh, comment on that is that I, I think as an entrepreneur, you kind of live and breathe your startup and it's your huge passion, but you can certainly, you do get a lot of flexibility from being a founder that you can structure your life in a way to have the other things you love in it. Um, a few other points to keep in mind. Uh, so big ideas you think, oh, I need a lot of people to get this done. Okay, more founders is better. Um, my first realization was that you, really need to know the people you're founding a company with and just do a lot of due diligence and do any early work together that you can before you officially decide to start the company. So at Get Around, uh, we use Singularity as kind of that test bed. We had 10 people on a project team and then uh, through that, basically three of us emerged as the co-founders. Uh, the other kind of lesson learned is basically to really focus. Uh, at Get Around, we, we do so much. We have hardware, we have software, web, mobile, uh, customer happiness, marketing, business development, government relations, all these different areas. And I think that is pretty common when you're dealing with a very big industry that you're trying to disrupt. But if I could do it over again, originally we were just gonna be a, an app. <laughs> and then for whatever reason, we did the site and then we inherit, we still have the site and people generally use everything. So uh, in general, I think the, as much as you, can on the big things and the big areas just focus on as few things as possible and do them really, really well. So those would probably be my two big ones. Um, so if we do a very interesting piece with you guys. Oops. Yeah, For Easily Do, it was very interesting. Um, like I said before, I hinted before that um, we were trying to build something we had never played with in a different forum ourselves. So we needed a lesson in, t in trust. And it took us some time to figure out how we need to trust our idea, that there was a real need for it. And, um, and the one thing we learned from this is to test your idea. And go and talk to enough people that you can have focus on your idea, which is, yes, there is a need for a proactive assistant. There is a need for a smarter, assistant that can go out and do all these tedious tasks for you that you spend hours doing um, in a week. And, and that's what was most important for us. We started off like a to-do list, and then we tried to put in this smart aspect to it, and then we were all fuzzy. People couldn't understand what we were doing. I think it was, and then we had to like change everything. We almost rebuilt our app about three times um, to focus on what we're doing. And I think if we had just focused on what we're doing from the beginning, we would have probably you know, spent less time on fixing it um, in path, and just as a background, as yeah. looking back. But I think um, there's some learning to that too. You know, sometimes you wonder, if, if I'd known this, would I have done it again? I probably would have, which is the beauty yeah, of this whole have, problem. You can't avoid iteration. Yeah. I don't think anybody gets there on their first try. No, and, and that's the thing. I think you need to learn that go with your guts, be what you are, believe in what you're doing. Even if you have a problem, talk to more people. Um, I think that all that will then fall into place. And don't be afraid of change. That was the other thing. We were very afraid of change, and that made us... Um, into an interesting company, but now we're like really bold and we change all the time and test it all the time. All right, I have, I have I, we can take two questions from the audience. It's hard to see the audience, but. Okay, you're gonna come up to mics. You better be good, there's only two. <laughs> I have lots more questions. <laughs> Um, so a lot of you had real jobs before you started your companies, with real companies, with, no, no, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you were on a track, you were, you know, becoming a manager and then senior manager and, and then you decided, forget it, I'm going to do my own thing. Um, any advice on taking that leap and just doing it? If you have a passionate idea and you think you're going to fix something, and you're definitely going to fix it for a lot of people around you, go for it. And I think that's the most important thing is believe and trust what you're trying to do. I've never had a real job. 
<laughs> However, I think that if you are, you know, like the passion thing I agree with, I think also like saving up a little bit to have a little bit of a cushion in case, you know, you don't make money for some time, which is known to happen. I'm sure a lot of people here will tell you about the times that they were running things off their credit cards. Um, so just, you know, having a little bit of a cushion and then, you know, passion carries you through it. I would say just get a rich husband. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hear a little bit about how each of you either found or met your um, fellow founders of the company. How did you go about looking for those people? How did you know when the, you found them? Sure, we went through an unusual um, incubator process where we were introduced to each other during that period, not as co-founders, but as potential uh, participants in the incubator process. And we went through very rigorous personality tests and presentations and group works and things like that. And we chose each other. Uh, it was a risk. It's not, I think, the, the conventional wisdom of how you pick your co-founders. But for us, it worked because we saw a lot of diversity and skill sets, but uh, alignment and mission. We care passionately about creating a product and products that make the world a better place. As cheesy as that sounds, like that is something we deeply, deeply were passionate about. And so it, it has just worked for us. For me, I knew uh, our CEO at Get Around from his previous startup in the founder community in Canada. And we both happened to be in the inaugural class of Singularity University and came up with the idea together. And he's an engineer, uh, and I'm the kind of business marketing side. But we also felt that we're trying to do so much technology that we wanted another deep engineer on the team. And so we actually were able to recruit our third co-founder through Yahoo iPhone Dev Camp. I kind of went in with posters and a couple other people and interviewed about 200 engineers in an hour or two and <laughs> recruited five of them for our hackathon team. And then through that, the one who was the most passionate and basically smartest and most talented, we, we recruited him. And uh, it's been amazing. Uh, I think three is a great number if you're trying to do something really hard. Uh, but again, just make sure there's that real, you really gel as a team and uh, you're going to be on the same page and also no kind of ranking order. Great. I have a wrapping question. If we, um, you know, you are each doing something disruptive in a very big field. You have incredible dedication. You've been super successful so far and you're visionaries. Paint a picture for us of how life will be different five years from now because you're at the tip of the iceberg of, of major change. Like how will work or life or transportation be different five years from now? Uh, for Lumo Body Tech, we see a world where we give your body a voice. And in the way that you're con you can check your email, you can check your health. And you can get you know, insights into your body, not only posture, but all, lots of other things about things that you care about um, so that it's at your fingertips. And rather than health being something you attend to a couple of times a year, maybe when you go to the doctor, health is something you attend to daily because that information and those insights are available to you at your fingertips. So in terms of the SlideShare, I think uh, we, we watch how people are, in terms of business communication even, uh, people are direct, authentic, and visual. And I think those are real trends in terms of business communication, professional communication being a lot more visual. Um, and people talking directly in their own voices. Some of you might have seen this presentation from the CEO of Netflix talking about the Netflix company culture. And it's a really simple presentation where he talks directly about what Netflix is like and what the logic of that is. It's not about sound bites, it's not about you know, press releases, it's just in the CEO's direct voice. And that's the thing that you know, I think we'll see more and more of, uh, like in the consumer world. Uh, so with Get Around, we really hope to see a shared car on every street block. We, we see the opportunity for everyone to share their car with someone. And with transportation, we really see a huge shift happening to it being more on demand, more convenient, more social. And uh, really, you won't have to own a car in the future. I think maybe not in five years, but pretty soon we'll see cars con driving themselves. And then that, that'll be a really nice way to conveniently share your car with others. We see so much disruption with ride sharing, um, so much disruption in the whole sharing economy of sharing different assets. And I really think it's just starting to blow up in transportation where your, your mobility device will be your smartphone and you can just choose if you want to be driven, if you want to drive a car, if you want to get a plane or <laughs> any type of mobility device you can imagine. Um. We believe in the age of context, and um, soon half the things we do get prompted to us by 
all these electronic devices and electronic apps and programs, and then we open up another electronic app to get stuff done. Um, I think we're gonna do less and less of that and enjoy life way more. So <laughs> the age of contacts is going to give us way more personal assistance, um, information on, on health, information on what's happening outside while you're inside for 10 hours, um, and so what you should do before you go outside. Things like that are just gonna change the way we behave and do things, so that, there we go. But I think it's gonna change. A lot of things have already changed and more change is coming. It is a really exciting time. I'm kind of picturing that movie Wall-E where everyone was like in those gliding <laughs> recliner chairs. It's not gonna be like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure our founders will be here to answer some questions after the session, but thanks again. And congratulations you guys. Thank you, Eileen. Test. Thank you, Aileen, for moderating the panel, the panelists. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.